Welcome everybody to um, this run through of an A2 level paper. This is from summer of 2014, paper 41. So let's just jump straight into it. Um, so the first question, the unicellular green alga chlorella photosynthetic uh, protoctase was originally studied for its potential as a food source. Although large-scale production proved to be uneconomic, the many health benefits provided by chlorella mean that it's now mass-produced and harvested for use as a health food supplement. Okay, so here we see the um, cells of chlorella. And in one study, into the productivity of chlorella, carbon dioxide concentration was altered to investigate its effects on the light-independent stage of photosynthesis. So firstly, the cell suspension of chlorella was illuminated using a bench lamp. Then the suspension was supplied with carbon dioxide at a concentration of 1% for 200 seconds. Then the concentration of carbon dioxide was then reduced to 0.03% for a further 200 seconds. The concentrations of RUBP and GP were measured at regular intervals, and finally, throughout the investigation, the temperature of the suspension was maintained at 25 degrees Celsius. So here are the results. Here we can see the results. Um, first question is one of those recall questions, so I'm going to be fairly quick with these ones, if that's okay. Um, so state precisely where in the chloroplast RUBP and GP are located, so <coughs> these ones would be independent reaction, so that will be the stroma. Um, next, explain why the concentration of RUBP changed between 200 and 275 seconds. Okay, so we're looking at this time interval here. Um, and we can see, we're, and we're looking at this curve, so RUBP. Um, so we can mention the fact that uh, at 200 seconds, um, the carbon dioxide concentration was dropped to 0.03%. So if you have a lower carbon dioxide concentration, then um, you would have less carbon fixation and um, less carbon dioxide combining with RUBP, which would then be converted to GP. So Ruby and RUBP is then, you know, as we know from um, the Calvin cycle, would be reformed to reform to reform from uh, triosphosphates. Okay. Calculate the rate of decrease per second in the concentration of GP between two hundred and three hundred and fifty seconds. Show your working and give your answer to two decimal places. Okay, so I think I'll write this next to the graph so it's a bit more obvious. So <clears throat> the question is asking between 200 and 350 seconds. Okay, so the drop is from 2 to 0.2 from the scale over um, a time period of 150 seconds, which is 0.012, but since it's asking for two two decimal places, that would be just 0.012 two dp. Okay. All right. And luckily, here are the units already, but always beware um, not to leave off the units. Okay. Explain how the decrease in the concentration of GP leads to decreased harvest for commercial, commercial suppliers of chlorella. Okay. So if we think about GP um, is essentially um, the first step for the output of um, the Calvin cycle. So you... The whole point of um, photosynthesis is so that you synthesize um, carbohydrates, um, lipids, and um, which could then be converted to um, amino acids, proteins, um, 
you can also mention a few, you know, one of the most important ones, of course, is glucose. So if you have less um, triose phosphate um, as a consequence of um, decreasing concentration of GP, then you would have less of your photosynthate, um, which would indeed result in um, chlorella not growing as much or not having as much um, output overall. So therefore, you would have a decrease in overall biomass. Okay. Second question. Russian scientists have discovered the fruits of a flowering plant in the food store in the burrow of a ground squirrel in frozen sediments in Siberia. Dating techniques suggest that the fruits were stored by the ground squirrel about 32,000 years ago, shortly before the ground became permanently frozen. Tissue samples were taken from the fruits and grown in a nutrient culture medium after treatment with plant hormones to simulate the growth of roots and shoots, 36 complete plants were produced. Uh, produced. These regenerated plants, which looked identical to one another, flowered and after cross-pollination produced seeds that were able to germinate. Explain why cross-pollination produces more genetic variation among the offspring than self-pollination. Okay, so um, here this question is um, wanting you to explain um, the difference between cross-pollination and self-pollination. So as opposed to um, having in regards to your genetic makeup, um, you essentially have two copies from the same parent if you self, um, but you have two different um, sets of uh, copies of chromosomes from if you do cross-pollination. So um, outbreeding versus inbreeding, and um, if you have if you if if you if you um, if you the offspring is a result of cross-pollination, then um, the diversity between the genotypes of the two parents um, will result in a new combination of alleles in the offspring, which results in more genetic variation. Okay, flowers of modern day S. stenophylla look similar but not identical to the flowers of the regenerated plants. Outline how uh, DNA sequencing could be used to compare the DNA of modern day and regenerated um, S. stenophylla. Okay, so this question is um, a pretty straightforward recall question of if you know um, the DNA sequencing methods that can be used um, for this purpose. So the idea that um, you would have your gene, you would have your genome, um, then the method is to cut them into fragments by restriction enzymes, um, and the denatured DNA then can be um, can be used to um, in a modified PCR reaction um, for sequencing for Sanger sequencing using um, DDNTPs or dideoxynucleotides, um, which would then result in chain termination. <coughs> and excuse my cold. Um, and whenever you incorporate, so you have the four different reaction chambers, all of them have the normal, the normal um, DNTPs and each of the four reactions have one of the, the dideoxynucleotides. So one of them has DGTP, the other one has a GATP um, and so on. And whenever um, the PCR reaction um, would incorporate a DDNTP, um, it would cause the extending chain to terminate and you get various lengths of um, sequence depending on when the chain termination happens so this depends on the um, concentration of the, your nucleotides and the different fragments um, can then be um, separated using electrophoresis and um, by using um, a fluorescent scanner um, you can identify the sequence of um, your nucleotides based on the different fragment lengths. Okay. Suggest a simple experiment using plants of modern day and regenerated as Tenophila to find out whether after 32,000 years they are still the same species. So this one, um, the easiest um, answer I think, 
um, is to see whether or not they produce fertile offspring. So you would cross-pollinate them and see if um, you get any offspring. Okay, next question. Wheat triticum astilum, sorry about the pronunciation, um, owes its origin to hybridization involving three different but related species of grass, A, B, and C. Each of these species had seven pairs of chromosomes, so that means um, a diploid number of 14. The hybridization process is shown in figure 3.1. Okay, so um, this is the root. Um, through which you can get to your T S T them. Using the symbols in the key, complete figure 3.1 by writing in the chromosome sets of T S T them. Okay, so if you go through um, how the whole hybridization event happened, um, <clears throat> so you have species A and species B, and the hybrid um, is sterile, um, and then um, so you get um, polyploidy here, which um, means that the chromosomes can now pair up, to result, which results in a fertile hybrid. And then by a similar mechanism here, um, from the sterile hybrid to get your fertile hybrid, um, the diploid number um, doubles, as we can see. So um, the sets, the genotype would be double this. So a B B C C okay. At the points labeled Y and Z in the hybridization process, a fertile hybrid was produced from a sterile hybrid. Explain why the hybrid A B is sterile and what occurred at the point labeled Y in figure three point one. Okay. So uh, as I've mentioned before, but um, let's go through it in a bit more detail. Um, <coughs> when you get um, uh, so AB is sterile because um, it's unable to form gametes. So um, when you get meiosis, um, your homologous chromosomes cannot pair up uh, because they are from two separate parents that don't have homologs. Therefore, um, you cannot form your gametes. So when meiosis, however, in some cells, um, meiosis is unsuccessful. So you get spindle, spindle failure, um, which means that you don't get um, the usual halving, halving of your chromosomes that you get um, in sterile in sorry in um, in non-sterile individuals. So you double your um, diploid chromosome number because so you get um, a gamete. Um, but the gamete has um, all the original number of um, chromosomes. But what this means is that in the next round of, um, um, but what, what this means is that the failure of cell division means that um, the chromosomes can now form pairs because you go from A B to a duplication essentially A A B B. So now each of your chromosomes have a homologue. Um, which means that they can now form gametes and meiosis can be completed. Okay, in 2012, permission was granted for a field trial in the UK of genetically modified TST. The wheat carries a gene taken from peppermint plants that results in the wheat leaves releasing a volatile non toxic chemical um, E beta F into the atmosphere. E beta F is not only produced by various species of plants, it's also secreted by aphids um, when they're disturbed by a predator. Two experiments have been perf performed into the effect of e, um, e beta F on the behavior of aphids. Okay, so in the first experiment, um, you either have 10 centimeter cubed of air from a syringe that contained uh, plant leaves that secrete E beta F, or you have a uh, 10 centimeter cubed of air from a syringe with no leaves. Um, that was added to um, containers with the aphids. In the second experiment, you have um, 20 centimeter cubes of air with 50 nanograms of E beta F, or um, the your control, which is 20 centimeter cubes of air with no E beta F. Okay, and then um, after this, uh, the number of aphids 
that moved away from um, the food was counted. Okay, so here is all of that result tallied up. And the first question, discuss the extent to which the results of these experiments support the idea that E beta F is an alarm signal for aphids, okay? <coughs> so, um, what we can tell immediately from, um, from this table is that um, the, number of the number of aphids that stopped feeding and moved away from the food leaves in the presence of E beta F um, in w whether that comes from the leaves or just E beta F in the air is quite high. So you can see that 54 out of um, 99 in the leaves case and uh, 111 out of 132 in um, the sort of more artificial um, experiment. So um, you could do a calculation of the percentages here if you wanted to. Um, and yeah, however, you could also mention some of the drawbacks, some of, some of the problems with these experiments. So um, the first one, that, so th these are these are what suggest that E beta F is indeed um, a deterrent for um, aph for aphids feeding. Um, however. It must be pointed out the fact that um, the two experiments used um, a, a different volume of air, and also the fact that um, there is we don't have any information about the concentration of E beta F in the air uh, because the E beta F just comes from um, what's secreted from the leaves, um, and here you have sort of like an artificial. Um, source of E beta F. So this might just be that um, a really, really unnaturally high concentration of E beta F indeed results in deterring aphids, but this might not be uh, representative of what happens in nature. <coughs> okay. And oh yeah, and of course um, you don't really have an, you don't really have a big effect um, with air that doesn't have any. E beta F in it. Other experiments show that E beta F attracts predators of aphids, such as ladybirds. Explain how growing genetically modified wheat secreting E beta F could increase the yield of wheat. Okay, so if you just um, go through it logically point by point, um, so if um, E beta F is secreted and it um, attracts ladybirds, that um, will result in the fact that the um, the attacked aphids will um, secrete more E beta F, and um, the aphids are deterred from eating the, the leaves and taking the nutrients from from the wheat. So overall, you get um, more healthy um, wheat that are undisturbed um, by aphids, and therefore you have a higher yield of wheat. <coughs> Suggest why growing this genetically modified wheat might be acceptable to people who object to the growth of genetically modified insect resistant maize or cotton. Um, so one of the big ones here, I think, is the fact that it was mentioned in the beginning of the question um, that uh, E beta F is um, already present in peppermint. So um, this um, this is attractive because uh, this is attractive to people who are otherwise against GM because um, it's sort of like a natural um, source of this. It's just a pathway that was that's present in um, this already present in peppermint. So they know that it's non toxic. Um, so there's no new sort of chemicals added to your diet. Um, it doesn't actually kill the insects. It has sort of like an indirect effect. Um, on the yield because it um, attracts the predators um, and also it doesn't really disturb the food web at all because um, the aphids are still um, available for the predators to eat so okay next one spermatogenesis takes place in the seminiferous tubules in the testi testis um, figure 4.1 is a diagram showing some of the cells in a small sector of the seminiferous tubule Okay. 
you use the diagram, on figure 4.1 state whether each of the labeled cells is haploid or diploid. Right, and if the cell is haploid and two, and if the cell is deployed. Okay, so these this is all sort of recall stuff, um, unfortunately. So I won't spend too much time on it. So the um, spermatogonium is still a diploid cell, so that would be 2N. Um, the primary spermatocyte is also deployed. Um, then um, meiosis takes place, secondary spermatocyte is N, um, and then the spermatid is, um, of course, just an immature form of the spermatozoan, so that's already um, an immature gamete, gamete cell, and then finally the spermatozoan okay. as a gamete um, is haploid. Okay. Spermatogenesis involves meiosis, mitosis, growth, and maturation. State which of these processes is involved in each of the following steps in spermatogenesis. This is all recall stuff, so quickly, spermatogonium to primary um, spermatocyte. <coughs> so this would be... Um, Mitosis as we know meiosis hasn't taken place yet and growth. Spermatid to spermatozoan. So um, again uh, as we mentioned before, spermatid just immature form of the spermatozoan, so this would be maturation. Okay, great. Next, state one role of the Sertoli cell. Okay, so um, you can mention um, a bunch of different answers here. Um, so I think um, the most obvious one is that it provides nutrient for um, the sperm. Um, you could also write that um, it helps in the regulation of sperm production. So, um, in terms of hormones, and um, it also can help to protect the sperm from um, the immune system because it has different um, it has a different genetic makeup to autosomal cell. Okay. In some men, spermatogenesis does not take place successfully, and the sperm that are produced are unable to fertilize an egg. A form of IVF called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, um, or ICSI, maybe in may enable them to father a child with their partner. In ICSI, a sperm cell is inserted into a secondary oocyte using a very tiny needle. Outline the treatment required in order to obtain mature oocytes as part of an IVF procedure. Okay, so this one is clearly another recall question, um, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, this is all, um, you can find all of these in the mark scheme. Unfortunately, this is not uh, one of the questions to <laughs> get creative on. Um, so you can mention the fact that um, you use um, gonadotropin um, releasing hormone um, agonists um, or receptor antagonists to prevent um, ovulation at first, and then um, you induce superovulation. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and, and then you um, you induce the maturation of your oocytes uh, and the resulting mature oocytes um, just before ovulation can then be collected from. Um, f from the ovaries, okay, and then can be, and then they are grown um, in culture. Sorry, yeah, and then they are grown um, in culture and um, fertilized using sperm. One approach to helping an infertile man to father children is to extract immature sperm spermatids from his testes and culture them in the lab in conditions that may increase the number of them that develop into functioning sperm. These can then be used for IVF. An investigation was carried out to see if adding reproductive hormones to culture of immature spermatids affects their development. Samples of spermatids were collected from men in whom the spermatids did not normally develop into functioning sperm. The spermatids were cultured in a suitable liquid medium uh, kept at 30 degrees Celsius. The samples were divided into four groups. No hormones were added to one group. FSH, testosterone, or both were added to the other groups. The percentage of spermatids that developed into elongated cells in each group after 24 hours and 48 hours was calculated. The results are shown in table 4.1. So here's your table, um, and you can see 
um, the effect of um, the different hormones on the development of the cells uh, over time. Um, and the first question asks you to describe the effects um, of reproductive hormones on the development of somatids after 48 hours. So we're only looking at this column. So um, the first one I think that you can see clearly is that if you compare these two, you see that testosterone alone doesn't have um, any effect essentially or negligible effect, if anything. Um, then we can also see that um, a combination of FSH and testosterone has the greatest effect um, um, and FSH has an intermediate effect. Okay. Suggest a reason for the apparent reduction in the percentage of elongated cells between 24 hours and 48 hours in some of the samples. Okay, so for example, here in the FSH, when you see a decrease, um, you see a slight decrease here as well. Um, so this one um, is just more likely uh, to the fact that some cells have died, and the reduction is quite small quite negligible, so it might just be due to chance. Suggest why the culture medium was maintained at a temperature of 30 degrees C and not at a core body temperature of 37 C. Okay, so this question um, is just a recall and it's trying to get at the fact that um, 30 degrees C is a similar temperature um, to um, what the test, similar temperature to the testes. Um, which have to be lower than the core. Um, normally it's between 30 and 35 degrees. Um, so essentially uh, this, the production of um, sperm, spermatozoa would not be successful at 37 degrees C to have a temperature. Sorry, bear with me while I drink some tea. Deer mice, or P. maniculatus, are small rodents that live in North America. Like all mammals, their blood contains hemoglobin, which combines with oxygen in the lungs and unloads its oxygen in respiring tissues. Deer mice show variation in their genotypes for the genes that code for the alpha polypeptide chain of hemoglobin. In most populations of deer mice, the majority of individuals have the genotype a1A1, while a smaller number have the genotype A0A0. In mice with the genotype A1A1, the amino acid at position 64 in the alpha polypeptide chain is aspartic acid. In mice with the genotype A0A0, the amino acid at this position is glycine. Okay, so A0A0 is glycine, the mutation, sorry, and then A1A1 is aspartate. <coughs> Suggest how the change from aspartic acid to glycine in the alpha polypeptide chain could have been brought about. Um, okay, so um, this one is recall about mutations, and um, you can mention the fact that um, this is um, a random mutation in the sequence, um, which in this case resulted in a substitution. So you could mention that um, there are uh, nucleotide triplets that code for one amino acid. Um, some of these point mutations, as they are called, so if it's just one base change, um, result in a silent mutation. Uh, but sometimes um, they change the code in the way that um, that will be recognized by a different tRNA, um, which will bring in um, a completely different amino acid in the original's place. So the important keywords here is that it's a substitution mutation. <coughs> the genotypes of deer mice from three different populations, each living at a different altitude, were analyzed. Figure 5.1 shows the relative proportions of deer mice with aspartic acid, white areas, and glycine, black areas. Okay, so gly asp, just so we know. At position 64 in the alpha form of titration. Okay. Describe the effect uh, of altitude uh, on the frequency of hemoglobin alleles in these populations of deer mice. So this one, um, we can see, so we already said A1 is aspartate, A0 is glycine. So we can see that um, the higher we go, the more glycine we get. So the higher we go, 
um, the more A0 we have. So high altitude, high altitude. more glycine, higher A0, and lower altitude. More likely to have the aspartate mutation. So you get more um, of the A1. And you get sort of the intermediate um, at the intermediate height altitude. Sorry. The partial pressure of oxygen is relatively low at high altitudes. Hemoglobin contained in glycine at position 64 in the alpha polypeptide chain has a higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin with aspartic acid at this position. So just how natural selection could account for the difference in allele frequency in deer mice living at high altitudes and low altitudes. So um, I think the main idea is that um, the mice that have the A0 mutation at high altitudes, um, they have a selective advantage to the mice that have the A1 um, mutation. Um, so essentially at high, um, essentially at uh, high altitudes where the partial pressure of oxygen is low, um, this acts as a selection pressure um, and um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so there is a disadvantage of hemoglobin with um, a very high affinity at a low altitude um, as it is less able to unload oxygen. So essentially, um, in this question, I think it's really, really important to stress that um, there is already a pre-existing genetic variation and um, the, the reason why you get different frequencies of alleles is because of the different selection pressures at different altitudes. Um, so if, if the glycine um, mutant is more successful at a higher altitude, they um, will survive um, and reproduce at a higher rate and pass on the A0 allele and vice versa. So, <coughs> so if you um, so if you have glycine in the alpha polypeptide chain, um, this is a dis this is a disadvantage um, at low altitudes because you are less able to um, unload the oxygen. Okay. The passage below outlines how sensory receptors work. Complete the passage by using the most appropriate scientific terms. A sensory receptor cell responds to a stimulant by opening ion channels in its cell surface membrane. Sodium ions flood, flood into the cell, causing the membrane to become depolarized. This is called oh this is called uh, the generator or receptor potential receptor. If this potential is large enough to reach a threshold threshold, then an action potential is transmitted to the central nervous system. An increase in the strength of the stimulus will result um, in the in in an increase in the frequency of action potentials transmitted. Okay, I think that was that's pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, another recall question. <laughs> Describe how an action potential is transmitted along a sensory neuron in a mammal. Okay, so <coughs> don't be afraid of these kind of questions because these are just recall. I think if you go through it just step by step logically, um, it will be fine. Um, so uh, maybe start with the fact that when you get sort of the depolarization. Um, the um, flooding in of your um, sodium ions um, diffuse um, inside the cell uh, and it gets sort of attracted to areas of the membrane with resting potential. So this 
then causes uh, the neighboring um, sodium ion channels to open, and you get sort of a second depolarization. Um, and then uh, you get transmission in uh, one direction. You can also mention <coughs> the myelin sheath and how the Schwann cells, the fact that you get myelinated cells like that. helps with the transmission of, um, so if you get an action potential there, you get diffusion of your ions and then depolarization again here. Um, these are the insula insulating myelin sheath. And um, so you get the depolarization is only allowed or happens at these nodes um, or they call the nodes of Ranvier, um, which are the unmyelinated parts. Um, <clears throat> and then your action potential sort of jumps from your node to node. Okay. <coughs> Occasionally during meiosis, homologous chromosomes fail to separate at anaphase. This is known as non-disjunction. Turner syndrome is the most common chromosome mutation in human females. It can occur due to non-disjunction in meiosis during the gametogenesis. Some resulting gametes will be missing an X chromosome. Some forms of Turner syndrome occur when one of the pair of X chromosomes is not missing but has become damaged. The damaged X chromosome may have been broken and reformed so that uh, part of the structure is lost. Figure 7.1 is a diagram of a normal X chromosome and two forms of damage, X chromosomes X1 and X2. So in X1, a section of the P arm of the chromosome is missing. This deletion leads to reduced height of the female and abnormalities such as narrowing of the aorta. In X2, a section of the Q arm is missing, which leads to um, no development of the ovaries. Okay, so this one, X1, is height and x2 missing of the q x2 no develop ovaries okay <coughs> new structure k uh, a quick, sorry, a clear recall question. So the structure K that would be um, the centromere, centromere, and then explain why X one and X two result in different phenotypes. Um, so this is another, I think, a pretty straightforward question. So if you just think about the fact that. Um, it's not the same part of your X chromosome that's missing. So you delete um, a different sets of genes that um, are present or missing, so um, which code for different proteins, different polypeptides, um, so they must result in different phenotypes. And then, Mothers with the X1 form of Turner syndrome can pass on the chromosome mutation to their daughters, but not to their sons. Complete the genetic diagram below to show how the chromosome mutation X1 may be passed on to daughters from a mother with a Turner syndrome. So presumably it can be passed on to sons as well, but it's probably results, the, the mutation probably results in a fatality um, and probably um, females with a normal X chromosome and a mutated X chromosome can survive. Okay, so normal male, X, Y, the gametes, X, X1, X and Y, <coughs> and then um, you can draw the Punnett square if you want, let's do it. Um, so from the father I'm only taking X because we're only looking at the daughters, so you will get the genotypes of your daughters would be XX and X, X1. So you get a phenotype of normal 
um, Turner syndrome. Turner's. Okay. Great. <coughs> Next question. A mitochondrion contains the DNA of ribosomes and is the organelle in which aerobic respiration takes place. Suggest the functions of the DNA and ribosomes in a mitochondrion. Okay. So, presumably, um, the, the question wants you to talk about just um, in general that the DNA um, is used for transcription um, of mRNA and then the ribosomes are um, then um, involved in the translation of um, the transcribed mRNA. Um, and also another recall bit is the fact that you probably need to know um, what sort of genes would be coded in the circular DNA in the mitochondria. And so these are um, enzymes that are required for um, respiration um, in the intermembrane proteins. <coughs> okay. Oxidative phosphorylation takes place in the mitochondrion. Different stages of oxidative phosphorylation are listed below. They are not listed in the correct order. So this one, um, you just have to go with the letter of the stage, okay? So what I think I will do with this is I'm going to just go through and number these so we can talk about each step. So the first one has already been named for us, luckily. So that's um, reduced NAD releases hydrogen atoms to cytochrome carriers. Um, the next step would be those hydrogen atoms are split to protons and electrons. Then these electrons that you get, the resulting electrons, are passed from carrier to carrier. <coughs> then uh, the energy from the electron transfer, see, so it's all sort of makes sense logically, um, is used to pump protons into the intermembrane space. So you set up that proton gradient. What that can that proton gradient be used for? Um, <coughs> excuse me. This next step is actually given. So, proton gradient is step is set up across the crystal. Then, uh, the protons diffuse through the channel protein into the matrix, and this um, uh, so the diffusion. Um, through ATP synthase causes uh, the produ production of ATP. And finally, um, the protons can combine with electrons and oxygen to form water. <coughs> ATP can be converted to ADP and inorganic phosphate by the enzyme ATPase. State the type of reaction taking place, another clear recall question, unfortunately. So um, you can say uh, that this is a hydrolysis reaction. Um, you can also say dephosphorylation or exothermic reaction because you're breaking down a highly energetic bond. Some parasitic worms, such as tapeworms, live in a mammalian gut where there is no oxygen. Suggest how a tapeworm produces ATP in this environment. Um, so this question um, is obviously um, wanting you to mention um, anaerobic respiration. Uh, so then you can mention um, glycolysis. So the fact that um, if you go from glucose or actually triosphosphate, but anyway, essentially get to pyruvate. You don't have to draw this out, just explain glycolysis. Um, and the release of energy from this reaction creates ATP. <coughs> okay. So you can explain the fact that you get um, a net gain of two ATP molecules per glucose. Um, and uh, the pyruvate gets reduced, so um, it gains um, hydrogens from your um, reduced NAD, um, and then to reform your um, your unreduced or oxidized NAD. Um, 
the um, pyruvate forms lactate and then the NAD is regenerated, um, which then finally allows um, glycolysis to, um, to continue. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so you can actually, if you wanted, you can draw the entire pathway. So you get, and then if you get two H on lactate. Okay. It has been stated that the kingdom of protists can be described as a very diverse group of organisms that share only a few common features. Discuss the ways in which members of the kingdom uh, protists are similar to each other and ways in which they differ. So this one, I think I'm just going to quickly go through it. Um, so you can mention that the similarities are the fact that these, so the protists, sort of, all of them are eukaryotic cells. So that are not plants, fungi, fungi, or animals. So you can go um, a little bit into detail of um, what makes a eukaryotic cell. So the fact that they have a nucleus, um, linear DNA that are um, that's associated with proteins, with histone proteins, um, and the fact that you've got um, membrane-bound organelles um, such as mitochondria, and the fact that um, they use ATS ribosomes, the cell that is not the organelle. Um, and then, then you can mention differences. So um, the differences of the fact that you have single cell protists or colonial protists. So you can um, name a few examples if you want. You can talk about Volvox, so sort of like more of the plant-like um, colonial multicellular organisms um, versus some of the unicellular algae, um, like chlorella, as we meant, as I was actually mentioned earlier. Um, then you can talk about slime molds if you want, uh, as another good multicellular one. Um, and then you can, um, so other than that, so other than the fact that they are single cell or multicellular, you can go um, into the fact that you've got autotrophic protists or heterotrophic protists. Um, some of them are motile, some of them are, are unable to move, kind of like animals or from plants. Um, and going off from that, you can also mention some that have a cell wall, um, a vacuole. So just think of sort of um, the different types of proteins that are animal-like, plant-like, or fungus-like. And the fact, also the fact that you, they are highly diverse. So they have, they are also really highly diverse in the way in which they reproduce. So they have um, varying types um, and lengths of reproductive cycles and life cycles. Okay, B. <coughs> Excuse me, tea break. With reference to any named species of plant or animal, explain why this species is considered to be endangered and outline the reasons that have caused it to become endangered. Okay, so um, this helps if you um, know uh, a few species of plants or animals that are endangered. So classic flagship, flagship one, like the panda. Um, so you can, but essentially the the main points are the same for any animal or any species. So there's a lot, really a lot that you can go in here. So um, <coughs> you can, um, you can uh, the one of the good ones that you can mention is that how does a species become endangered? So who says, who puts that label on them? So that would be the International Union for Conservation for Nature. <clears throat> then you can talk about the fact that they have become endangered because their habitat was um, destroyed, whether that be um, from a natural cause or from humans or from, um, you know, for example, um, deforestation, um, or there could be other causes like climate change. So the rise in temperature, for example, um, meant that, um, let's say, if it was um, like an algal species, that the um, average temperature was too high for the um, for the algae to uh, to thrive, so they had to essentially their habitat was destroyed as they knew it. 
um, the fact that maybe climate change or for other reasons, um, there are some predators that have increased or have colonized. So we can talk about um, invasive species that were maybe introduced by humans accidentally. So for example, rabbits in Australia is a classic example. Um, you can talk about um, the uh, changes in, um, in food availability. Um, you can talk about pollution. You can talk about um, you can talk about the fact that um, there was no control in um, human exploitation. So, um, so which includes pollution and actually a lot of uh, the reasons that we've already discussed. But you can talk about hunting directly um, or removal. Um, so yeah, there's actually a lot to go into this. So if you just think through it step by step. Um, these reasons, a climate change is always a really good one, and um, the other one, um, human. So the human impact on the environment is also a very common, um, a common reference that you can throw in there. <coughs> okay. Next, <coughs> um, describe the action of penicillin on bacteria. Unfortunately, so <laughs> this one is um, again a clear recall. So you can. Um, so, but this one is, I think. Um, pre pretty simple if you remember um, the reaction or why um, penicillin um, kills bacteria. So um, if you recall, bacterial walls are made of peptidoglycans um, and um, they secrete um, chemicals which uh, are called autolysins. So they essentially make holes in their own walls, um, which um, allows for growth. So <clears throat> Uh, allows for the uh, for the cell wall to stretch and for the cell to grow, um, and these uh, so these um, uh, glycoproteins have cross links um, between the peptidoglycans, um, and the penicillin <coughs> inhibits the formation of these cross links. Um, so they actually inhibit the peptidase that forms the cross links, um, and this causes the whole the integrity of the cell wall to weaken um, and uh, because um, of um, uh, the differences in soy potential between the inside and the outside um, the bacteria will take up more water by osmosis and the increased turbo pressure um, eventually will cause the cell to lyse because it doesn't have um, a strong cell wall to maintain its turbo pressure okay. Next, outline the use of microorganisms in the extraction of heavy metals from their ores. So unfortunately, again, this one I think is one of those procedures that um, you need to know, but it's not a very complicated one. So um, I think you do need to know the name of um, the, um, the bacterium that is used in what's called bioleaching. So it's called um, acidithio... Sorry, acidithiobacillus. So in this one, um, <coughs> um, so you can say that bio leaching is used for low grade ores, um, and the the idea is that you want your insoluble ores turned into soluble products. So the way you do this. Um, is it actually independently of um, the lactobacillus, some uh, Fe3 plus ions um, will oxidize the ores. But in addition to this, um, if you set up acidic conditions and you use these um, uh, bacteria, um, they, they will oxidize some compounds um, and make them soluble. So for example, <coughs> they will oxidize <coughs> FES2 <coughs> using oxygen into soluble um, products, which then can which can then uh, be further purified um, uh, to retrieve um, valuable products, so valuable metals. Sorry. Um, so uh, these bacteria um, can oxidize sulfur. <coughs> sulfur oxidizing bacteria. Um, and then the Fe3+, plus, um, as mentioned before, oxidizes the ore. And, and then, but the bacteria help in regenerating um, the Fe3+. Plus. Um, and 
um, in addition to this, uh, you can also mention the fact that uh, the metal is can be displaced by adding scrap iron. So, um, for example, copper plus Fe, you can get metallic copper. So clear displacement reaction, um, where the copper is the oxidizing agent and iron is the reducing agent. Um, okay. So yeah, that's um, essentially it. <coughs> um, so I hope you found this useful. Sorry about the coughing and um, my cold. Um, and see you next time. Thank you.